steal credit for my hard work? You take the blame. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. In this episode, we start off with a supervisor who steals credit for someone else's work, but then has to take blame for the catastrophe too. Followed by a mismanaged family business that gets managed with revenge. An employee who badmouths everyone in the company, gets forced to defend his lies before all managers in a board meeting. Lastly, a company fired an employee, but loses more over it. Before we start, avenge and demolish that like cookie for Uncle Royal AI. Let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. I started working in a machine shop after I finished school with a two-year degree in machining. Learned all kinds of programming techniques that could make most machines perform more efficiently and output measurements of parts currently in the machine to automatically perform quality control. This greatly increases quality of parts as well as reduce waste and human error. I also learned many tricks along the way to make sure that my work could not be stolen. It's my first day on the machine shop floor, and I immediately notice inefficiencies in all the machines in my station. We had to manually perform quality control, sacrificing production time, while also leaving tons of room for human error due to the poor quality of measuring instruments in the shop. I'm new and eager to prove I'm worth more than the original pay they offered. I told my supervisor to let me spend an hour to add a line of code to a machine to demonstrate my skills I learned in school. My idea would immediately cut waste down by a large portion without slowing production rates on the line. My immediate supervisor humored me, thinking I was overconfident, trying to brown nose the engineers and lead programmers so I could get brownie points or something. Quick backstory to note, I had zero experience in a production plant and this supervisor had 30 years experience in the field. He had a very proud attitude, and genuinely worked very hard to learn what he knew. He was decent to work with. But when I would ask questions about some of the basics on this machine, like how to get to the program so I could edit it, he would block my view of what he was doing, and get to the end result quickly without explaining the process. Being new and wanting to learn, I'd always ask to have him show me what he did. But he always refused and claimed it was his way of securing his job. Anyway, I programmed the function into the machine in about 2 hours, 40 minutes, and when it comes time to demonstrate the process, it catches a part that is out of tolerances according to the blueprint. I also programmed the machine to output different messages, providing instructions to whoever the operator was on ways to resolve the issue if the part couldn't be salvaged. I also added some neat features to make it all easier to operate and to ensure and better the quality of production. All of these functions were performed automatically, without any input from an operator. This is a pretty magnificent feature to have in production, and my supervisor knew that. The supervisor who observed the demo, immediately went to report this to higher ups, who came to view the new feature I had implemented. As the next part was being produced, the quality check move initiated and found that the second part was also bad, and output a message to change tools X, Y and Z. The managers were incredibly surprised that this was all done on a 18-year-old machine, and they looked to my supervisor to ask how he figured it out. Long story short, he actually took the credit, and was given a raise on the spot. It didn't register to me that that's what happened, until I went to ask if he was going to credit me for my work. He said, yeah, but you gotta put in the time to get to where I'm at. It doesn't matter that you did the job, cause without me, you never would have known how to do your fancy programming in the first place. The managers had left for the day, so I couldn't fight my case right then. The next day, I was planning on informing the managers that I was the one who did the programming to do that. The managers were also former machine shop veterans with 20 plus years in the workplace and refused to believe me. Not only that, they basically yelled at me for trying to steal credit from someone who has worked their way up in the company and learned everything on their own and not from some school. I went to my station even more angry now, where I was met by my supervisor. He told me that I needed to go around to all the machines that could perform that function and add it to the code. I said, not without a raise, 
my code saves you guys tons and brings the bottom line to a level that McDonald's qualified workers could produce infinite numbers of parts with minimal loss. He said if I didn't do it, I would be fired. So I faked my compliance and started to change code on all the machines. If you know anything about programming, you know you can make something function a certain way, until a certain value is met, and then have it completely change afterwards. This was my job security. So I set the quality check up on 18 machines the first day, then the last 30 that weekend, and the managers were praising the supervisor uncontrollably for his innovation. Well, the programs were all set to operate as normal, and do quality checks like I programmed the original machine. However, I programmed the rest of the machines to keep track of a new variable. They would run and self-check just fine. Until they reached a random number of parts produced, this was different on each machine, where it would then throw up an error code. This could only be cleared with a password I had set for it. If a wrong password was provided, or someone just hit the reset button, the machine would take its largest tool in the turret, and run it rapidly into the solid chuck at maximum power. I made it so about 65 to 75 hours of production would go smoothly, before my job security would kick in. It took three days for the machines to hit their magic values, but when they did, boy oh boy was it magically satisfying. The first machine to crash was making parts for the drivelines of a major motor company. The crash was caused while a new and experienced operator was running the machine, who I might add was only hired because the program I made let them hire clueless and experienced people into the shop, and be able to still produce good parts. When he tried to clear my password code, the machine started turning at 2500 revolutions per minute with a large heavy drive shaft base in the holder, switched to a huge drill, and ran the drill into the holder, causing the tool holder to be knocked off axis. The part holder and tools to be destroyed, as well as cost the company tons to get someone from the machine's maintenance team out to repair it. After the first glorious crash, I menacingly mentioned to the supervisor, you should check your codes to make sure they're working properly. He went ghost white. Not a second after, three more machines simultaneously crash in glorious fashion. He starts to chew me out, saying I'm in huge trouble. But as he starts cursing, the managers are there to have him go diagnose the problems with his codes. The supervisor, not wanting to admit he stole my work, doubles down, and says confidently, I know what the problem is, and walks off to the crashed machines. Not a minute after they turn a corner, more machines start crashing. I just sit idly by and listen to the glorious sounds of my nuclear revenge playing out. A few minutes later, all the workers are told to stop production completely. We are all kept in the shop until they can figure out the problems. This is a 24-hour production facility with three shifts of workers coming in seven days a week mind you. Our shift is nearly over and we've all been idle for about seven hours. The next shift comes in and we leave for the day. I hear nothing from the shop, so I just go in the next day as normal. Turns out they tried to fire machines back up during the night shift and 18 more machines crashed like the others. The plant did a formal layoff of most of the workers the next week, as they were hemorrhaging money from all the damaged machines, on top of labor paid without any production. We filed a class action suit against the company for unemployment, lost vacation time, dangerous work conditions due to the severity of the crashes, etc. The company went bankrupt from the lawsuits and losses in production slash machine repairs. The guy who took my credit was obviously fired, and had an article in the paper about him sabotaging the company's production. He obviously told them I was responsible for the crashes, but the company found out that the code to my password program was his name. They believed he did this out of spite cause he was refused to raise the previous year and his threats to them after his last evaluation. Sucks to suck, he he. A few years after I started university, a friend of my mother's, who we will call Cook, started a restaurant in a small town a couple hours outside of the city we lived in. It was really a glorified hot dog stand in a golf course. My mother had invested money into this business, so she had a personal stake in ensuring its success. That meant, that she would often enlist us, my brother and I, to wait her when she could not do it herself. And my brother felt hatred for this guy, though I don't blame him. 
Cook had no idea how to run a business and he was completely computer illiterate, and had me set up the Google account for his business. This in itself wasn't the issue, but he was completely uninterested in learning, he just commanded us to do such things for him. And in order to get us to work in his business, he would pick one of us up from our home, drive us two hours or so out of town, and we were basically stuck there until we were driven back due to the fact that neither of us had a driver's license. And since my brother had problems with this guy, I was the one who more often than not, had to spend two to ten days at a time there. My mother was no better. She would often volunteer us that we would be working two days in the middle of a week, making job hunting for an actual job we wanted a very difficult thing for us. Furthermore, she treated us not as employees but as her children. Thus, any mistake was clearly our fault and not because neither of them could. A. Train staff. B. Use a computer at all. C. Manage a business at all. D. Utilize my brother and I in the most effective way, considering my brother had already graduated university and I was working towards a double major in business. They were completely unprofessional. They would host shouting matches in Chinese for customers to hear, and the kitchen was filthy, despite Cook's insistence that the kitchen was the cleanest place in a restaurant. Yeah, right. An ice rink was less slippery than the ground in there and he would routinely touch cooked food after handling raw meat. I distinctly remember sweeping up what I thought was a green bell pepper only to realize it was a moldy onion ring. Even the stove area was dripping grease. Literally, a big drop landed on my arm one time. They could not train staff at all. They had hired five people in the first year, and none of them came back the next. Cook in particular was especially two-faced in how he handled customers. He would smile at them and greet them, remembering details from previous conversations. And then turn to me and say in Chinese about how they're all stupid, stingy retirees with too much money and the free time on their hands. All of this left a great feeling of resentment in both me and my brother. Not only was it effectively trapping us to work for this completely incompetent individual, we would get basically nothing out of it. This was particularly frustrating for me because, as a business student at the time, I could see all possibilities for the place to improve. I even offered to write up some policies, do some inventory management and take a look at the administrative side, just to help out and get some experience for myself. They kept insisting that they didn't need it. Sure, we were paid bare minimum, and the guy did know how to cook, but we have to bear the brunt of their frustration while hiding the fact that we were sick of helping out. Until we couldn't anymore. Last year, I graduated university. It was not as happy of a time as it should have been because my grandpa passed away the week before. I couldn't even celebrate the night before I walked the stage because A. I had to give part of the eulogy the previous day. B. I had to mediate an incident between my brother, my mother, and cook because my mother couldn't. No pre-graduation shots for me, because I was stuck on the phone for three hours listening to how insensitive cook was over the fact that my grandpa just passed away. But I figured that once I walked the stage and I had my diploma, I could spend that next week job hunting. No dice. Immediately after I graduated on the Monday afterwards, my mother Volan told me that I had to work 10 days in the hellish restaurant. I lasted six before it happened. By all accounts, it wasn't that busy of a day to start off with. There was a breakfast brunch for Father's Day that barely anyone attended and most people that did show up wanted to order off the menu. But both Cook and my mother were incredibly stressed out and both of them were taking it out on me. My mother spent the day micromanaging me and finding flaws in every little thing I did. Like cleaning an empty table over clearing plates from a table out on the deck, to not immediately refilling coffee or water when a glass or mug was half full, to not table touching every five minutes. Cook just shouted a lot and gave contradictory orders every two minutes. But it was the combination of my mother and Cook screaming at me for a mistake I didn't even make, something about a sauce that a customer requested but they got mad about. They refused to listen to me, literally shutting me down when I opened my mouth, and Cook mocking me for breaking down in tears. I remember him saying, you're 25, you should know better than to cry over a stupid mistake. This made me realize, that not only could I not handle it anymore, but I wanted to burn the place to the ground. 
I booked a flight out of the province that day and left a week later. I didn't even tell my mother when or why I left. Remember how I said that not only were they completely unprofessional, but also completely computer illiterate? Despite the fact that I was no longer in the province, I still had all the login information for the business. Furthermore, because I knew all the laws that he blatantly refused to learn, I knew all the violations that he had committed in the business. For the first part of my revenge, I signed out his computer from the Google account. I don't think it was really necessary, since he never used that computer in the first place for anything other than adult material. But I want to make sure that he and my mother wouldn't be able to stop me. Before I left the province, I claimed the business in review sites using the email and the business phone number. Then, I blasted every single review, positive or negative, with all the shit he used to say about customers. Any negative review was immediately mocked. Any positive review was left with a note of thank you, you cheap, any questions were met with hostility and it basically boiled down to, I'm right you're wrong. I also make mentions about how he didn't wash his hands in the kitchen, and the stuff that they're yelling in Chinese are insults about customers. Given that it was a tourist-based town, I'm fairly certain that deep dip of sales that my brother mentioned later on was because of all those. And no one suspected a thing because my mother and cook didn't know how to work the internets and my brother didn't care enough to look up the business. Next, I meticulously documented all the complaints that I had between my brother and myself, as well as the ones from the few people cook had hired, but never kept because he could not train them. I reported the two times that I slipped in his kitchen, incidents where he refused to wash his hands in between handling salad and raw meat because it took too long. And I handed those off to the health services department. I also anonymously informed the tax revenue agency that he was severely under reporting income, as employees were instructed only to write down the credit debit receipts to report in sales. The third part of my revenge wasn't really my part to be honest, rather it was because of his own incompetence. As I said before, he was completely computer illiterate. I didn't even have to lock out the person he hired to do accounting because he didn't bother reporting his expenses except hand them a garbage bag full of receipts. To be honest I felt kind of sorry for them, but because their hands were tied, they couldn't dispute any of the claims that I made. What I did do however, was text them all the things that my mother and cook said about them so that they wouldn't bother trying to defend his booty. They quit a month before the doo-doo hit the fan, meaning that Cook was left holding the bag. So naturally, given that the business wasn't making near as much money to make rent, let alone pay off all those fines that he was slapped down with, the government repossessed everything. From everything in the dinky little house that he was renting for business purposes to every single fork and knife he bought. Because of all the health code violations, he couldn't find a job as a cook again, which was his only job for about 30 years. And because the tax revenue agency knew how bad he was with managing businesses, they naturally denied him when he requested a permit to open up a growing operation. As far as I know, he's no longer in contact with my family, but his brother-in-law, who is my mom's hair stylist, mentioned that he had to move somewhere else to get away from all the bad reputation. My mother mostly got off scot-free, because all of the business permits and licenses were under his name, but she lost quite a lot of money and last I heard, my family had to move into a smaller house. And no one knew that I was the one who was doing it. My brother suspected, as he relayed details of what had happened to me, but I never confirmed it. Not that he would tell my parents because honestly, frick that hellish restaurant. As for me, I'd like to say that everything's sunshine and roses but my decision to impulsively move provinces had its ups and downs. I did manage to find a place to live and a place to work, so at least I'm alive. It's challenging, but I'd rather be doing this than going back. My story begins with Brad. He was an engineer with a planning and support department for a portion of his company's infrastructure that impacted virtually every other part of the company. Unfortunately, Chad was a real doo-doo face. During less than a year with the company, he had thoroughly trashed everyone in his department to anyone who would listen. He talked about their incompetence, their screw-ups, which were generally minor, and most importantly, their failure to properly support the very mission-critical infrastructure they were responsible for. Every bump that occurred, however minor, was used as ammunition to badmouth the company. 
What Chad told everyone who would listen, eventually made it up to managers and directors throughout the company. That wasn't enough though. Chad made the mistake of trashing his own director, who was also his manager. Over the next few months, there was no one even remotely involved with his department who didn't know what Chad was doing, including that manager. Chad's manager and director was Tim, a pretty crappy manager by most measures. He paid about 40% less than the industry average and had a staff of BNC players because of it, but he nevertheless expected absolute dedication from that staff. If he could have had them wash his car and pick up his dry cleaning, those things would have been added to their job descriptions. Tim was also pretty poor when it came to understanding what his own staff did and routinely made things up about their work while talking to other people. Everyone involved knew he was full of doo-doo, because what he said made no sense at all. Most rolled their eyes, but people also knew that Tim was a force to be reckoned with. Despite his shortcomings as a manager, the one place Tim excelled was corporate politics. He was able to consistently come through failures without a scratch when those failures would have sidelined anyone else. Tim would deftly play opponents off one another, then stand back and watch the fireworks. He had been at it for years and seemed to have a Teflon coating. Sticky trash that stuck to everyone around him would slide right off. Tim, of course, knew exactly what Chad had been saying. Eventually Chad's trashing of his own department became so severe and their reputation so tarnished, that a large director's meeting was called to discuss the situation. The other department directors were out for blood. Enter Tim's revenge. Tim tasked Chad, the very person responsible for the company gossip that resulted in the high-level meeting, with the job of putting together and then presenting a formal defense against his own gossip. Chad had to spend the next couple of weeks creating a formal presentation and repeatedly submitting it to Tim for approval. The meeting rolled around and Chad was forced to stand up in front of a large group of company directors and managers and formally defend his own manager and department. Everyone at the meeting knew they were only there because of what Chad had been saying, and they sat back and watched him tear himself apart and prove the things he, himself had been telling everyone were flat out lies. Of course Tim and his department came through completely unscathed, but Chad was thoroughly discredited throughout the company and knew it. He left that company for another within six months of that meeting and off course, last was heard bad-mouthing everyone involved with his new company. So I used to work at a family-run builder's merchants and was a trade sales advisor. I was fired for bringing up health and safety concerns in an email sent to a manager and for the fact I was apparently unhappy in my role. I did nothing wrong but they still sacked me. Now when I worked there, I had clients that I had built good relationships with and even become friends with some of them. They would get me beers and whiskey at Christmas or have barbecues and so on outside of work. Anyway, I was fired which in my opinion was unfair and it was during this COVID-19 pandemic. I had worked the entire way through it until I was fired. So I wanted revenge. I contacted multiple clients slash friends and most of them side with me telling me that they won't use that company if they treat the staff the way they did to me. One client easily spends over $100,000 a year, this was easily in the top three customers they had. He used them, because I would get him the best prices and more benefits. As soon as I'm fired, I call him and let him know what happened. He straight away promises not to use them again. So that was a big middle finger to the owners of that company. I also contacted ACAS and they are investigating. I hope you learn to treat your employees better or go under. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give Royal AI some sugar by avenging the like button. Could you imagine doing one of these acts yourself? Share your experience below. I'll join the conversation.